defense contractors, these private contracting military contractors, have been getting away with murder. I mean, I think quite literally for decades. And elements of the United States government, the, the so-called deep state, which I refer to as the dumb state, um, they've been doing things that are reprehensible, certainly subverting, at the very least, subverting the Constitution, subverting Congress. I had, after the hearing, after the hearings that took place in, in Congress, I had a, a particular, one of the congressmen on the committee called me and wanted to discuss the topic of UFOs with me. One of the congressmen told me that he had been, you know, that, that he had been warned by somebody in the Trump administration who just sort of gave him a heads up and said, hey man, watch out, you got guns in your house? You know, are you armed? Uh, just watch your back because, you know, the intelligence community, elements of the military industrial complex, defense contractors are not happy. No one knows the shadow world of UFO government conspiracies better than This is Timothy Albrino and you are watching End Times Productions. An encounter of the first kind, that's when you see a UFO. EWA 517, do you want to report a UFO? Over. The only people have time to do that are UFO freaks like moi living in trailer parks. Sir? I think you need to go on TV and convince the people that there is no such thing as a UFO. I think that because we are a telepathic race, well, we don't, we don't, we we can't function, we can't utilize this functionality anymore because of genetic degeneration or because of an intentional dampening of this capability. So, so if you have a telepathic race out there and you are thinking about stuff and you're contemplating, well, well, they're connecting to that. And maybe, and I believe that, by the way, the Greys are looking for people who, are, who have a heightened capability, let's call it a psychic capability, uh, whose who's, who's, uh, psychic faculties, and I'm not talking about seances and stuff like that, I'm just talking about our ability to to project our thoughts, um, perhaps a latent telepathic capability that is more awakened uh, in some people. The Greys are looking for those kind of people. They're actively looking for them. In fact, they use psychics, you know, your neighborhood psychic. Um, you can, uh, I derive that from, from the abduction material. It beca it's, it's become evident to me that that is in fact the case. So why would they be looking for people who are, who are less psychically broken, let's say, who, who, who still retain some of these latent capabilities, at least to a higher degree than the rest of us? Because the, the control of the grays over, over human beings is a telepathic, is a psychic control. And so if you're more, if, if, if you're more inclined to this, predisposed to these capabilities and you are easier to control and to communicate with. And I think that's, and I believe it's genetic. I believe that's why it's hereditary and in regard to abductions. And so I, there's, an, there's a presence out there that's actively looking for people who are, who are predisposed to that kind of communication, to that kind of contact and control via this alien presence. And again, um, I have reason to believe that. I believe it, it appears that that, that, is, that that is one of the factors that the greys in particular are looking for in the human species. And again, you can go to the abduction material, specifically the work of Carla Turner, and, and, and you, will, you will see what I mean, um, especially as it relates to the story of one Ted Rice in a book called Masquerade of Angels. Carla Turner was harassed, her and her family were, were aggressively harassed by someone, by some sort of agency, perhaps a defense contractor or some branch of the military. There's no question that, that, that the Turner family was being harassed. Both Carla and her husband and their children were abductees. Her husband actually suffered a handful of military abductions, which were worse, by the way, than the alien abductions. And um, very strange things happened to the Turner family. 
Um, Carla, for example, would be on the phone talking to a friend of hers, and this is back before cell phones, it's back in the, the dial-up days and um, the, the hardline days, and and her conversation would be interrupted by a third party who would make a comment or something. Uh, it was her continual harassment, and then uh, she was one of the first and most vocal people to to, to speak up about the abduction phenomenon. And um, Carla was brilliant. And unfortunately, she was stricken with a very, very aggressive fact, fast-acting cancer that killed her in a, in, in, a, in a short period of time. And there's the suspicion that, that she was killed, that she was murdered with cancer, basically. No way to prove that, but um, she was certainly harassed. The Turner family was certainly harassed. And I, I think people need to return to Carla Turner's work because it's very relevant to things that are happening today. And um, her material, I think, is just exceedingly well-researched. And again, I think she was brilliant. In my estimation, now, I don't, know, I don't know all that's happening out there in the world of ufology, but there was a quality, and I've sp spoken to my colleagues about this who absolutely agree. Again, I had this conversation with Richard Dolan the other day. There is a, a, a clear discrepancy between modern ufology and old school ufology and that discrepancy is in regard to the quality of the research. Um, the old researchers like Leonard Stringfield, Bud Hopkins. Bud Hopkins, these guys, these old school guys, Carla Turner, David Jacobs, John Mack, John Mack these guys were professionals. They they had a very high standard in regard to their methods. They were old school investigators. George Knapp is one of these guys. George Knapp is still around. He's one of these old school investigators who I have a great deal of respect for, um, who would chase down stories, who would do the legwork. That was old school ufology. They took it very serious. They were very concerned with evidence, evidence-based research, um, and they had a standard of, of professionalism that I admire and I think is lacking in ufology today. Ufology today is UFO Twitter. Ufology today is speaking at conferences, watching YouTube videos, making YouTube videos. Modern ufology is not what it, what it was. Uh, these guys, a lot of these old school guys, paid the price in many ways for their investigations more than a few investigators were killed uh, by the military contractors or, or, or by elements of the United States government. Um, and so the quality of these old school ufologists, the quality of their investigations and of their research, in my opinion, was on a, on a, a higher level than what we're seeing today. We've, the research that's out there today is diminished in regard to uh, I think, in regard to its, um, in regard to its methods, and we just, it's, it's become very easy to be lazy in ufology. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, ufologists were not famous people for the most part. They weren't making a lot of money. They weren't they weren't going around speaking to big conferences. They weren't on Ancient Aliens. There were no TV shows. Very rarely, sometimes Bud Hopkins, these other guys, would go on television shows. But but it was but it was ridiculed. They were they were exposing themselves to ridicule. People rolled their eyes at the topic of UFOs. It wasn't like it is today. It wasn't creating celebrities. It wasn't a topic that everybody is is interested in. Back then, you were a kook. If you were a ufologist, a ufologist, if you took this seriously, you were a kook. So guys like Stanton Friedman, and even though he was a, a nuclear physicist, and, and even guys like him were considered to be kooky because they believed in UFOs. And these were brilliant guys. These were top-notch ufologists, investigators. And there was nothing in it for them. I and mean, they would write books. Sometimes their books would become uh, very popular uh, like Whitney Strieber's book, Communion, and so forth. But for the most part, UFO conferences were very small. 
The UFO community was, was, was not what it is today. It was taboo. There was no social media. Ancient aliens didn't exist. So it was a different world. The researchers were heavily invested in the topic because they, they were genuinely curious. They wanted to solve the puzzle or they had some sort of an experience in their life, like Carla Turner, previously mentioned Carla Turner, that compelled them to try and figure out what was happening. And unfortunately, that caliber of research isn't around today anymore. Um, you have great UFO historians like, like Richard Dolan, who I, would con who I would put in the company of these old school researchers. Yeah, they're still doing great work. I, I, I mentioned, they, I, I mentioned uh, George Knapp, Richard Dolan, George Knapp. There's still guys out there. To some extent, I would say, Dr. Greer, there's some guys out there that are doing the kind of research uh, that, is, that is to the level of the caliber that the old guys were, the old school guys, and, and I appreciate their work. Um, but most of it is UFO Twitter. Most of it's hearsay. Most of it's just social media fanfare. It's become too popular. It's become too mainstream. Uh, there's too many YouTube channels. There's too many podcasts. There's too many people on Twitter and social media who are muddying the waters because their information just comes from watching videos watching YouTube um, mainly. I would say that's where the vast majority of the information comes from. And so they're not firsthand researchers. They're not investigative researchers. They're not on the ground. They're not doing the work um, that, for example, MUFON used to do and still does to some extent. Um, and so you, you get a, the waters get muddied with, with lower caliber research. And it's a lot of hearsay. It's a lot of rumor. And uh, the UFO community is, is, is um, there's a hostility there. There's an animosity. Everybody's on a team. Everybody's on a team. And, and I get, for example, a lot of people who are, who are on Team Greer who come and lambast me, you know, because I'm not acknowledging, uh, I'm not acknowledging Greer when I say certain things. And I get people coming from different, different, different camps, and it's very strange. It's become very tribalistic. The, the ufological community, that's why I kind of stay on the outside of it. I don't speak at the symposiums. I don't go to the big uh, UFO conferences. I'm sort of an outsider because it's, it's very toxic. It's a toxic environment. And, um, and I'm very careful, the kind of people who I associate with in this community. Um, I make sure that the people that... that that I'm drawing information from are the old school caliber researchers like Chase Kletsky, Richard Dolan, George Knapp, these kind of people. You know, th this is the research. Th their research, Stringfield's research, for example, Leonard Stringfield's research, is just as relevant, if not even more relevant today than it was. The, his Situation Report series, which almost exclusively deal with crash retrievals, is has never been, no one has ever produced a better, better material on crash retrievals. He, the, the, what the Stringfield, Stringfield's work is the foundation for understanding what's happening today in regard to David Grush, the testimony that's come forth in Congress, everything that's been going on recently. The foundation was laid by Leonard Stringfield, right? And the same can be said for the abduction stuff, which hasn't, the abduction stuff hasn't, hasn't raised to the level of Congress yet, hasn't become, isn't being featured yet very much by the media, but when it, and it will, ultimately, it will. And, and when it does, it's important for people to go back to the, to the foundations, the intellectual foundations, the good research, um, which is Mack and Hopkins and Turner and Jacobs. I respect any ufologist whose investigations are furthering disclosure. Any ufologist who's bringing forth, who's uncovering uh, material either in the field or documents and who are bringing forth viable witnesses verifiable witnesses who are who are adding to this effort this push for disclosure I respect those researchers and I don't have to agree with everything they say or everything they think but I respect the effort and I commend the effort and 
there are a handful of guys out there who are really who have been very instrumental in in all of this, and and I I certainly applaud them. I don't have to agree with everything everybody says, and they don't have to agree with everything I say. Um, but I think we all, what we all want collectively is transparency. We want to end the secrecy because there's a lot of nefarious things happening behind the scenes. Um, these these defense contractors, these private contracting military contractors, have been getting away with murder. I mean, I think quite literally for decades and elements of the United States government, the, the so-called deep state, which I refer to as the dumb state, um, they've been doing things that are reprehensible, certainly subverting, at the very least, subverting the Constitution, subverting Congress. I had, after the hearing, after the hearings that took place in, in Congress, I had uh, a particular, one of the congressmen on the committee called me and wanted to discuss the topic of UFOs right. with me. And and so I've subsequently I, I I was able to to do this briefing with some of the congressmen on the committee um, uh, via Zoom one day or via the internet and and I met personally with one of the congressmen and and I can tell you that the core group of guys in Congress in in the Congress committee are in the House rather the House committee are dedicated and are motivated and are and and these guys are are sincere about getting to the bottom of this topic about popping this cap of of disclosure and revealing all of the mess that's inside of there to their to 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 their own peril by the way they they fully understand what they're up against and, and these guys know and one of them told me one of the congressmen told me that he had been you know that that he had been warned by somebody in the Trump administration who just sort of gave him a heads up and said, hey, man, watch out. You got guns in your house? You know, are you armed? Uh, just watch your back because, you know, the intelligence community, elements of the military industrial complex, defense contractors are not happy. The, the, the committee that's going on in the Senate that Gildebrand was heading is a dog and pony show. Okay, that's a dog and pony show. The committee that was was formed in in the house the uap committee in the house that one's for real now there are i would say a substantial group of congressmen and women who are a part of that committee who are in it for the tv time but but the core group the core group who's behind this thing who i've interfaced with these are good men these are sincere men and and they should have our full support because it's not a psyop it's for these guys. It's not about the TV time. They are genuinely concerned about this apparatus of secrecy that's been er erected around this topic that has been deadly for some people, but certainly has subverted the American people, the Constitution and Congress, and needs to be reined in and and the information that they've been holding, at least much of it, perhaps not all of it, but much of it needs to be disclosed to the American people. These guys are tenacious. They're not going to stop. Um, and I don't know how far they're going to get. They're already, you know, they're already hitting the wall uh, in a lot of ways. They're already being blocked and obfuscated. Um, but I think they are making headway. I think they're, at the very least, they're creating an environment in which is much more friendly and accommodating to whistleblowers, which is very helpful. Um, so, I, so I commend these guys. I commend these guys and gals. You know, um, Congressman Eric Burleson, uh, Congressman Tim Burchett, Congresswoman Anna Paulina Luna, Congressman Matt Gates and, and others who, who are at the forefront of this thing, I think are doing a phenomenal job. <laughs>